Hello everybody, I welcome you all to this video. Today we are going to talk about a most prestigious university in the world. Yes, you're right. We're going to talk about Stanford University. We're going to see how to get a PhD in biology in Stanford University. What are the different processes? What is the checklist that is required? And what are the different research themes? That is what we're going to see in this particular video. I'm Dr. Vaishali, academic specialist at Biotechnica. Biotechnica is a space where we guide you on anything and everything regarding your bioscience career. Come, let's explore the video. Firstly, uh, this video is sponsored by Biotechnica. Biotechnica is the world's largest platform of bioscientists. You can check this particular website for different, uh, you know, career guidances for different CSIR net preparation, etc. Internships, works, workshops. So all of these you can check in this particular website. So there are a lot of workshops coming up. There are ongoing workshops as well as future workshops that are there. You can see all of these in this particular link. The link will also be given down in the description box. Thirdly, there are also internships going on. The next internship that's going to happen is all-in-one R&D internship that starts from the 27th of December. Stay tuned for more updates on this particular internship in other videos right you can contact this particular phone number or the email id for more information about this internship so there's also a drona batch for csir net preparation with also which also comes along with the scholarship right so you have you can play you can pay monthly as low as rupees 4000 only and you can get a one year subscription for the drone up batch right all your workshops will be free as well as your internship for the drona batch people you can call on either of these numbers or you can also visit the website for more information so let us now jump into the topic so we were talking about stanford university right so first let's let's see what are the different phd topics or what are the different research themes that happens at stanford right so the first is uh, phd in biology second is biochemistry biomedical informatics biophysics, cancer biology, chemical and systems biology. Next is developmental biology. Next is PhD in genetics, in genetics, in immunology, in microbiology and immunology together, in molecular and cellular physiology, neurosciences, stem cell biology and regenerative medicine as well as structural biology. So these are the different themes or different research uh, topics that happens at Stanford. So you can get a PhD in any of these themes that has been listed below, right? So if you are a passionate biologist who wants to get into Stanford, then these are the different PhD options that are available for you. Next, what are the features uh, of a PhD, of getting a PhD at Stanford? If you get PhD at Stanford, then what are the features that it contains, right? First of all, it is a full-time course, right? There is no part-time course available for PhD, right, at Stanford. Secondly, it is an average of five years of full-time financial support. So the average amount of years that it takes for you to finish PhD at Stanford is five years and it is going to be a full-time financial support is going to be provided for you. Thirdly, it, the, the intake in Stanford for PhD is very low. That is, it's a small research group that is every year only 25 to 35 new students are taken, which means that there is a very fully focused, individual focused uh, training as well as research guidance that can be provided by your supervisor. So yes, that is the reason they have kept the number of students, number of intake per year to a very minimum compared to the, you know, the large, uh, you know, organization of the university that it is. 
Fourthly, you need to decide on a potential advisor, right? So you need to, uh, you know, decide on which topic that you'll be doing and who could be your potential supervisor. And this has to be also mentioned in your SOP. Right. Next. So how do you decide on a potential supervisor at Stanford? Right. So the first and foremost top uh, point to be noted here is that you see the faculty's profiles, right? So these faculty's profiles will be available for you at the website of Stanford itself. So you read the faculty's profile and you find out what they are working on now, right? So these, so there is a possibility that, uh, you know, uh, the, the website not might not be uh, you know updated with the current work that the professor is uh, doing so it is always better for you to find out on what they are working right now because it might have shifted as well so it's uh, so what are the sources that you can find the current research current research that the professor does is through online or through the library so this can be exhaustive, but yes, it's going to definitely be fruitful for you if you do this particular exercise where you go and see what is the current research that the professor is doing and you understand their interests, right? And help you decide if yours match with their interests, right? So that is more important. You find out what is the current research that the professor is doing and you see if your interests match with the, you know, the, the project that they are doing, right? The next point I want to talk about is contacting the supervisor, whether it's good or bad to contact the supervisor at Stanford, right? So it is not welcomed by every uh, professor out there. So some of them might be open to it, might reply to it, uh, re reply to your query or anything. For example, you want to know what is the current research that they're doing. And so you write to them to find out their interests as well as you put forth your interest before even the review process has happened, right? So if you do that, there are few faculties who are, who welcome this particular approach. They do reply to you, but there are a few other supervisors as well who do not uh, welcome this particular step. So they might not reply to you. So whatever effort that you're putting out there might not be as fruitful as you expect. But yes, it is uh, necessary for you to see a potential supervisor, see what their interests are, what their current research is, and if yours match with them. So that is uh, very important. I could say it's mandatory for you to do because it has to go in your SOP, which is the statement of purpose, which is a very important document when it comes to evaluating your application. So the next point we're going to talk about is eligibility. So eligibility here in the case, particularly on Indian students, right? So uh, the eligibility for different uh, country students are different. Uh, so here, particularly, we are going to talk about the eligibility of the Indian students, right? So first is you could have done a bachelor's degree in engineering or medicine. And it's very important that this particular bachelor's degree has to be a four years bachelor's degree, right? So whether it's engineering or medicine, it has to be a, f a total of four year course that you must have completed. It's not applicable for a three years bachelor's degree in any subject, right? So if you have completed only a three years bachelor's degree, for example, in India, we could have uh, something like BSc. Then no, you cannot, after completing your BSc, you cannot apply for the PhD at Stanford. But if you have completed BTEC, which is a four years course, then you can apply for PhD directly at Stanford. Next, if uh, say, for example, yours is a three years bachelor's degree, then it's then it's mandatory for you to have completed a two years master's degree as well. So if you've completed a two years master's degree after your three years bachelor's degree, then yes, you are eligible to apply for PhD at Stanford University. Next, what are the different test requirements that is there at Stanford? That is what we are going to see. First, we are going to start with TOEFL requirements. Now, 
if your first language is not English, right, then you need to have a minimum score of 100 for applying for PhD at Stanford University. So this is a very, so for any graduate, any PhD graduate program, out of all those research themes that we saw, for all of those research themes, in whichever theme that you want to get into or whichever lab that you want to get into for PhD, it's important for you to have a minimum TOEFL score of 100, even for applying uh, for the particular PhD program. Next, so what is TOEFL? TOEFL is the test of English as a foreign language internet-based test. So that is your TOEFL IBT. So it, it basically tests your English. It gives a confidence to Stanford University that your English is good, right? So if uh, you have given this particular TOEFL IBT, the traditional TOEFL IBT, and you've scored um, more than 100, then yes, you are eligible to apply for PhD. But if you have given TOEFL IBT home edition or TOEFL IBT paper edition, then you have to take an additional test that is English placement testing, which is done by Stanford University itself. So if you were not able to give the traditional TOEFL IBT for some reason, and you have given say TOEFL IBT home edition or TOEFL IBT paper edition, then you should also give a an uh, English placement test that, you know, Stanford itself holds. So only after clearing these both can you apply uh, for the PhD. So this basically happens in the enrollment stage. Next is the um, Stanford University does not accept the TOEFL essential scores or any other English proficiency test. So it is just TOEFL IBT that uh, Stanford accepts and acknowledges. So any other English proficiency test is not accepted in Stanford. Now, what about the next set of tests that is GRE tests? So we all know that there are two different types of GRE test. One is GRE general test and the second is, second is GRE subject test. So for different um, research themes that we saw or the research topics that we saw, uh, especially for PhD, for different, uh, for different topics, the requirement of GRE, whether you need GRE or you don't need GRE is different, right? So it differs from case to case basis for both general as well as subject. So yes, uh, so there are three different possibilities. One is required. Second is not required and the third is optional, right? So these are the three different um, different options that are there in case of both GRE general as well as GRE subject. So required and not required is quite straightforward, but what is this optional? So in optional, what happens is the GRE, the whatever GRE score that you've got for either your general or your subject based on the case will be uh, put forth to the admission committee. So, and later the admission committee may decide whether it wants to include your GRE score in the process of evaluation or not. So this is what the term optional means, right? Next. So for which all subjects or for which all themes do you require, especially in biology, which are the themes that requires GRE uh, general and GRE subject and which are those that does not require? That is what we are going to see. First of all, it's biophysics. We are going to look at biophysics. So in biophysics, the GRE general is not considered or not required, but your GRE subject is optional. We already saw what optional meant. Secondly, for chemical and systems biology, if you want to do PhD in chemicals and systems biology at Stanford, then both GRE general as well as your GRE optional, uh, your GRE subject is optional. And for the rest of all of the subjects that we saw in our previous slides, the different subjects uh, that can be uh, taken uh, for PhD at Stanford. For all of those other subjects, apart from biophysics and chemical and uh, systems biology, you do not require 
or you, the, the GRE general as well as the GRE subject scores are not considered for evaluation of your application for PhD. Next. Next, the next requirement that is necessary for applying for PhD is the statement of purpose or SOP. So your SOP is supposed to be a typed, single spaced and should be between one or two pages. So this is what the format of your SOP should be. So in your SOP, you have to clearly mention what is the reason for you uh, applying for this particular PhD position and what is the preparation you have done for this field of study, right? Have you done any research already? Did, did you have it in your academic curriculum before? So what are the other type of preparation that you have done for this particular study? Thirdly, why is this program a good fit for you? Why do you think you're qualified for this particular program? And next, what are your future career plans. So, so you talk about your past, you talk about your present and you also talk about your future in the basis on the basis of this particular field, right? So that is what your, uh, your statement of purpose includes. And as we saw in the previous, um, you know, slides as well, that your potential faculty member, you have to indicate who can be your potential supervisor because you should have done those research on them and you should have realized that it matches your interest and that is how you come to a potential supervisor and you include that in your SOP as well. The next requirement for applying for PhD at Stanford is the letters of recommendation. Yes, it is the letters, it is in plural because you need three letters of recommendation. Three letters of recommendation are necessary for applying for PhD at Stanford. So this, um, so getting this letter of requirement, it is a strictly online recommendation that is necessary, that is whoever is going to be your um, your faculty or your academic faculty or anybody who is going to give the LOR for you. So they have to directly uh, log in into the system and then they have to give the recommendation. So and this has to happen before the deadline and you have to be responsible for making your, uh, you know, recommenders recommend you for this particular PhD as well. So that is upon you. That is, it's up to you uh, to make them, uh, you know, give the LOR before the deadline. So the LO, the, the faculties or the professors who give you LOR, they, they should have supervised you in an academic or an employment setup. So this is what is necessary for the professors whoever are giving you LORs. So finally, we come to the final checklist that is necessary, right? So let us just go through it one by one. We have seen them in detail as well. Now we are just going to see what are the different items that you need, need for applying for PhD at Stanford. The first is of course the application form that you get online in the website of Stanford. Secondly, the statement of purpose that we saw what has to be included in the statement of purpose. Thirdly is the LORs that is like letter of recommendations. We saw previously uh, who can give you the recommendations and how they can give you the recommendations. Next is your CV and resume which it's typically one page long, but yes, there is no, uh, you know, limit uh, that has been prescribed for your CV or your resume. Next is, of course, the transcripts. Of course, the transcripts of... Um, Next is, of course, the transcripts of your, uh, you know, previous study, that is your bachelor's or your master's. So those transcripts and the test requirements as well. So we saw about TOEFL, and about GRE, right? So these two test requirements about their scores and whether you have qualified the minimum score or not. So all of this has to be checked before you start applying for PhD at Stanford. With this, we come to the end of this particular discussion. I'm sure it was super helpful for all those of you who are looking at doing PhD at Stanford. I wish you all all the best and see you all until next video. Bye.